Hey guys, and welcome back to the Art and Business of Writing podcast. Uh, I'm Chris, your host. Do you ever dream of being an ultra productive writer, scratching all those creative itches, but you're really not sure how to do it or whether you can do it? Well, my guest today does just that. Christine Stoddard is a Salvator- Salvadorian, Scottish American writer and artist who lives in Brooklyn, New York. Her writings have appeared in Marie Claire, The Feminist Wire, Bustle, Teen Vogue, The Huffington Post, Good Housekeeping, Ravishly, So to Speak, uh, Jim- Jimson Weed, and Beyond. In 2014, Folio Magazine named her one of the top 20 media visionaries in their 20s for founding Quail Bell Media. Christine is the author of Hispanic and Latino Heritage in Virginia, the History Press, and OVA, a forthcoming chapter book. I'm sorry, a forthcoming chapter book uh, from Dance Girls Press. Christine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, dude, man, what a laundry list of amazing writing accomplishments. Oh, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I- <laughs> <laughs> man i tell you it was like it was like sweating as i was like wow look at all she's done this is amazing this is like the dream so when did you first realize that you were interested in becoming a writer honestly ever since i was a little girl um i've been writing my own stories, even writing for the school newspaper ever since I was a little girl. um, I was just constantly making little zines and comics for my younger sisters. I would illustrate my work. I also do some visual art as well. And I I would just staple together these tiny magazines and sell them to my my baby sisters for a quarter each. (laughs) (laughs) I would write for, yeah, for the elementary school paper. I was the editor of my middle school paper. I was involved in my high school paper. Uh, this is all I've wanted to do, tell stories of different kinds. And exactly what sort of stories I've told over the years has definitely evolved. But, yeah, just knowing that that this was what I always wanted to do really set me up early. <laughs> And so, you know, what kind of writing did you envision that you would be writing as an adult, you know, as you grew up? Oh, my gosh. So when I was little, it really fluctuated because, of course, I was a kid. So I had everything from dreams of becoming Lois Lane to dreams of becoming a playwright to being a cartoonist to wrote and illustrated my own work to uh, writing screenplays for for movies and TV, really everything. And I've been lucky that I've gotten a chance to try a little bit of this and that. But in my adult life, <laughs> <laughs> I've mainly done uh, journalism and fiction. Oh, awesome. Now, you founded Quail Bell Press. Tell us a little bit about what Quail Bell Press does and the kind of work that you're producing. Yeah, sure. So when I was in college, um, I had already had multiple internships at that point, starting in high school, really. I grew up in Arlington, Virginia, which is just outside of D.C., so I was very fortunate that I had access to incredible teachers and mentors. Um, I was already taking writing workshops on the weekends at the Washington Post. They had a program for high school students. Uh, So by the time I was in my third year of college, I thought, you know what, I've I've learned some very important lessons already, and I want to just give it a shot. Like, journalism's changing, publishing is changing, and you really don't need a lot of money these days to get something started. So I started quailbellmagazine.com, the website. I crowdsourced, I I kickstarted for some money to do print magazines, a a literary journal that we put out a couple times a year. And I just kept at it for for the rest of college, gradually getting more classmates and friends involved, even reaching out on Craigslist and getting people in other cities. Uh, I, most of our contributors early on were not even people that I knew personally. They were total strangers who I just found online. And 
Yeah, I mean, through through the magic of Kickstarter and Indiegogo, we were able to raise money to go to zine festivals and table and show off our our fiction, our poetry, our comics, our illustrations, just these different uh, projects that I would edit with friends and put out. So in 2012, I decided... Well, yes, some of these projects are expensive, and I don't want to have to do a Kickstarter every single time. Um, so we, uh, let's see, Julie, Denicio, Jade Miller, Kristen Rebello, and I, um, who are all VCU students, former VCU students, graduates now, um, we put together one manuscript of our favorite pieces that had run on the online magazine and in some of our zines. Um, and we submitted it to Brandy Lane Press in, in Richmond, uh, Virginia, where we lived at the time. And Brandy Lane immediately accepted the anthology. Um, the original idea was because Quell Bell is set up that we have fiction and nonfiction, we have two portions of the site, the real and the unreal. And everything falls within the imaginary, the nostalgic, the otherworldly. Originally, my idea was to have the anthology be double-sided. So you would flip it over and it would be fiction and poetry on one side. And on the opposite side, it would be essays and articles. So uh, Brandy Lane nixed that idea and they said, we're going to do se two separate anthologies. We're going to have the real as one anthology and the unreal as the other. So before I knew it, we went from having one book to two books. And <laughs> initially I was a little bit disappointed because I was so focused on this concept of what I wanted. And then I figured, you know what? We have two books. <laughs> That's amazing. And we have somebody who believes in us. So they signed us up for the Virginia Book Festival. They really just were amazing in in helping Quell Bell get some more attention. And um, yeah, we've had our print projects written up in Time Out New York, Washington Post Express, a bunch of different literary magazines and websites about literary culture. And I think things really took off once Brandy Lane said, hey, we're going to give you these books. We're going to get them in Barnes & Noble. We're going to get them on Amazon. We're going to get them in indie bookstores. Uh, and now we just keep chugging along. Uh, we're going to try and, and get a publisher to put out our third anthology next year. We'll see. Wow. That's exciting. That's awesome. And I want to unpack a lot of the stuff. You said so many really, really cool things. And so I want to unpack and get you to answer some questions a little bit deeper. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. No, I just gave you an overview. No, I'm I like, love it. <laughs> no, I love it. So, you know, so, so for our listener who is in, a, is in a high school or their high school age, 16, 17, 18, um, you talked about interning while you were in high school. How do they go about doing something like that? Where would you find internships with publications the way that you found uh, the internship with Washington Post? Yeah, so if you were if you're in a big city, then certainly you just have more access to certain opportunities. So like I said, I interned at the Washington Post the summer after my freshman year of college. But when I was in high school, I did their uh, workshop program. So that was a Saturday program. And this is something that more and more um, – regional newspapers are doing they they have some kind of teen program because they're trying to uh groom the next generation of journalists because nobody knows what journalism is going to be i mean it's constantly evolving now that we have the internet um i know the richmond times dispatch has a similar program for teenagers i don't know the particulars but really i would just look at the city paper um and figure out what kind of opportunities they have. If you live in a town where there are literary presses and you want to go more that route, it's really the same thing. You go talk to your high school counselor or your English teacher or your journalism teacher, have them take a look at your resume, see if they have any connections to some of these places. If they don't, at the very least, 
<laughs> the publisher will probably be amused and impressed that you've taken the time to email or call them with your resume. They might be busy and they might not have anything going on, but it's worth taking a look. Um, the other program that really helped me out in high school, which sadly just closed uh, a couple months ago, was Young DC. So this was a teen newspaper that was distributed throughout the DC metro area, including in Maryland and Virginia. And uh, they would get teens from across the area to meet on weekends and we would produce a newspaper, a monthly newspaper. And we'd go all around the area covering issues that were relevant to, to teenagers. Um, and yeah, because it was, it was produced by the National Press Club. It got lots of eyes on it. Um, I did live... Now, I, I don't want to say, hey, you can only do these sort of things if you live in a big city, because I lived in Iowa, of all places, for my first year of college in a very tiny, tiny town before I transferred to VCU in Richmond. And, I mean, that the town was... 10,000 people with everybody, like all the college students and professors. And I worked for the weekly newspaper there. And honestly, that was probably one of the best early experiences I had. Like, it doesn't sound impressive writing for this tiny paper, but it, it was. I mean, people love their local newspapers and magazines. They probably read those more loyally than anything else because that's what's going on in their community. And when you're, when you're in high school or in early college, often those publications are more willing to give you a chance. If they see that you're smart and you're hardworking, yeah, just, just call them. Just email them and see what they have going on. They'll, they'll probably take you. <laughs> now, does that same sort of tenacity work for someone, say, they're 28, 30 years old, they want to try a new career. They, I mean, they've taken journalism maybe in college or in high school and they say, you know, I've, I really miss being a writer. I'd love to try to write some stuff for my local publication. Does that same strategy sort of work there or is it a little bit different when you're trying to get in later in life? I mean, I can't speak from personal experience there, but I can speak about what I've observed in some of my friends and acquaintances. I just turned 28, but most of my friends are in their early 30s. Um, and I do know some, I have some acquaintances who are in their forties even, and they, they are moms now, but their kids are school age. And I've seen, definitely seen people who didn't start out right out of college, just write their local newspaper, you know, email an editor or publisher and say, hi, I have these clips. Like I have this blog. I do this. I'd really love to write for you. I think it's always worth a try. Um, I don't like sure if you're young and you know what you want to do that's great but it's also not bad to try things later on in life I mean it's probably better to take those kinds of risks and I think usually people experience like a pre editors appreciate the life experience I mean when I was 18 what was I going to write about being a teenager <laughs> you know there was I just like, yes, I was curious and I was going to research and I was going to interview people, go and actually report. But there there were just so many things I didn't know yet because I was a kid. And it helps when you're in your 30s or 40s and you've already lived some of your life. You've already been an adult. You've already paid your rent. You're, you've already voted. You know what's going on in the world. Um, yeah, I think it's worth a try. I definitely agree. Uh, you know, you have to take those chances. And I think more often than not, you find that, you know, especially with the local papers and local magazines, that they are more than likely to get, they're more willing to give you a shot. If, yeah, like, like you yeah. said, if you've got that life experience, if you know what you're, if you know your audience, you know their audience, you know what they're talking about, they'll, they're likely to give you that shot. Yeah. And especially if you've had a career outside of journalism and publishing and you want to bring some expertise, like if you've worked in sales, there are lots of magazines like trade publications, for instance, that are just about sales and advertising. Um, you don't you can look at community papers, but you can also look at trade publications that will probably value your expertise. If you've been a nurse, there are so many different medical and like nursing magazines and websites specifically 
um, like daily, daily nurse is one of them. You know, you just bring that out, that life experience, that professional experience, and you, especially if you're in a, a highly desirable field where there aren't that many great writers, then you are definitely at an advantage. Now, when you talked about your literary journals, we'll, we'll shift gears to that. You talked about you crowdfunded your literary journals. What's the best way to go about that? If I've written you know, a literary journal, put one together, you said that you used Indiegogo and you used Kickstarter. Did you have, a, did you have one that you thought was better than the other or easier than the other, or was it project-based? Uh, I like them. I think it's project-based. I like them for different reasons. I know the rules have slightly changed, but at least when I use them, it used to be that with Kickstarter, you had to raise the the exact goal or more. So if your funds came in under your goal, then you didn't get any of the money. Whereas with Indiegogo, it didn't matter. You raised what you raised and you got every dollar, even if you didn't reach your funding goal. Um, so that may have changed since it's been a little while. But, um, I mean, both both were great for social media promotion. I think that was the biggest thing, like just emailing friends and family, posting on Facebook, uh, trying to coordinate with local organizations and businesses and media, just getting eyes on the campaign. As long as the website, and there are so many different crowdfunding websites now, not just Kickstarter, not just Indiegogo, as long as the site allows people to donate by all the major ways, like PayPal, credit card, uh, probably Venmo now, then I would say it's fine. If they have some way for you to push out the, the links on social media and people can donate multiple ways, you're probably golden. Just think about how you want to package it, figure out how, like why somebody would look at this project and want to donate. What's cool about it? What's enticing to someone who's not just you or your friend? Now, when you put and when you put your stuff on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, you know it's not just there to sit because you see a lot of projects there and you're like, wow, it's not getting any traction. And, it's like, and you look at it, you're like, I wonder if they're just letting it sit. Like, how much work do you have to do to make sure that your product gets funded? Oh my gosh, so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say if you're Honestly, if you're strapped for cash like I was, I was a college kid, then Indiegogo or Kickstarter is probably worth it because you're not going to make that much money waiting tables probably, right? But if you have discretionary income, <laughs> if, you're, if you're in your 30s or 40s, you probably have a little bit more money lying around than I did when I was 19, you know? Um, but if... But if you don't, like maybe all your money just goes to your kids, maybe all your money goes to your yard, your car, whatever, then Kickstarter and Indiegogo can be can be good for raising money, but you really have to do so much promotion that when you d break it down by the hours, you're like, gosh, maybe I should have just taken a little out of my savings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. I know because uh, I, I did Indiegogo for my book and it, it was fun. I had a good time doing the promotion, uh, getting raising the money. But yeah, it is. It's a lot of work because you're spending a lot of time on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and telling people to go check out your project. And um, but one of the one of the, the big things is, you know, that I think people get hung up on is how to set their pricing. Do you have any tips for that? Like, you know, you had your anthology. How do, how do you set pricing that wins? So I really had to think about what what was limited, um, what was limited edition, what was special, what's something that they couldn't have just bought somewhere else. Um, so I wasn't going to give – so Quellbell's magazine um, – bookstore we have a little online bookstore and we do have certain things that are for sale year round i mean five dollars ten dollars nothing's that expensive so we weren't going to give away any of those price prizes like those items as prizes or incentives we wanted everything to be special so if you donated then 
we could have someone make one of our illustrators make a bookmark, like a design specifically for the donors of this Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, or we would put your name in the zine. Um, we would put a thank you on the website, whatever, just things that again, were special in some way. There was no way that someone who hadn't contributed to the campaign could go out and get the same thing. I think for lots of people, they just want to be recognized and they want to be affiliated with a project that they love. Um, so you don't have to go out and spend like half of your goal money, half of what you fundraised on these incentives. Uh, just think of ways that you can tie the donors to the project and make their connection clear because lots of people just want to be able to say, hey, I helped fund, it, fund that. Like, look, my name's in the zine. My name's on the website. I got this bookmark. I got this postcard. I got this limited edition print of the cover and it's signed by the artist. Just anything that makes it distinctive in that way. And I wanted to, to quickly add that um, I think even if financially Kickstarter and Indiegogo is not always worth it, I think it's definitely worth it for the promotional aspect because all of the hustling you do on social media and reaching out to media outlets, you're spreading word about your project and you might not be as inclined to do that if you are just drawing from your savings account. Like, okay, here's two grand that I'm going to put toward this uh, because you already have the money. But when you're promoting your Kickstarter or your Indiegogo, you are trying to bring everybody in your social network to at least look at this site. And even if they don't donate, they know about something that you're doing and they might not have known otherwise. Nice. Yeah, I, I definitely tend to agree with that. People do want to feel like they're part of the project. They want to feel like they did fund something that was successful. And they want to, and people do want to feel like they're part of your success as well. Um, yeah. Now, you know, I'm not, and I'm not going to get into, you know, how to build anthologies. We did that. And if you guys are listening, uh, if you're just tuning in or we did that on episode 34, go check that out um, in iTunes or Stitcher or however you're listening to podcasts and you can learn more about how to create an anthology. Uh, but I want to talk to you next about Brandy Lane. You said that you guess basically you're, um, you pit, did you pitch them or did they come find you? Like, how did you get your anthology into the hands of a publisher? So we curated our favorite submissions from the site. We sort of had um, themes going around the real and the unreal. We actually designed everything. Like after we copy edited and uh, adapted everything for print, we had one of our designers lay everything out. She did the cover art. She did a couple of spot illustrations. So we presented them with a PDF and it was already a book. It just had to be printed and bound and distributed. Uh, but we did a lot of the grunt work. That's not typical. Many people will, most people will submit either a, a prospectus or a manuscript in a Word document to a publisher, but it hasn't been designed or anything. We just figured we want to get this out fast, like reasonably fast. It still took a year, even though we had everything packaged. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to accelerate the project and have a certain amount of control because Quellbell has a very distinctive aesthetic. Uh, yeah, we just emailed them that that PDF and went back and forth from there. But we heard back from them almost immediately. Um, it just took a year to, to to mull over those particulars to make the books perfect. Now that's that's interesting. Uh, like you said, you know, most people do tend to send the query ahead of the of actually completing the project. Do you feel like by sending them the complete, like letting them know and sending something completed, they gave you like a distinct advantage? Yeah, definitely. And it was something they thanked us for. Now I I know that other publishers would not appreciate that. It really depends on the publisher. Uh, what what their guidelines are, if they have a specific aesthetic, 
that they always go by, like when I did my book, Hispanic and Latino Heritage in Virginia, and I worked with the history press, they have a very particular format. So you cannot just send your completed manuscript to them because you have to adhere by all these guidelines. And there's a long list. So if you were to submit something finished to them, Honestly, you would probably just have to go back and do the whole darn thing all over again anyway. So I would say definitely look into the guidelines for the publisher. Look at their previous books, too, and try and get a sense. Like with something like an anthology where we're doing the best of from a magazine that's been around for, at that point, had already been around for a few years, like, obviously, we were going to draw from cl completed works. Like, we were going to continue editing them and making them better, shine more. But we weren't starting from scratch. We were still starting with pretty substantial amount of work to begin with. Now, with, with, pitching, um, with pitching your books, do you find that it's been easier for you to pitch them to publishers now that you've already had experience with publishers or how was that first time? And then how has it been since then? Oh yeah, no, definitely. I think once you've done it, it just gets easier from there and you have to, the only difference is again, you have to adapt from publisher to publisher, but it's like really anything in life. If you've proven that you can do it once, then people are more likely to give you a shot at it the second time or the third or the fourth. Um, so the first books I contributed to were not my books. I submitted uh, works to different literary anthologies that were published by various presses over the years. I started doing that in high school. Um, the first one was by Candlewick Press, and that was an anthology of love poetry by teenagers. It sounds really corny, but it's it's a pretty funny book, um, and it's meant to be funny. Uh, it's very tongue-in-cheek, and that, that was reviewed in the New York Times. Like The editor who put it together had basically made a career of editing different kinds of literary anthologies. So yeah, so when I... The first book that I... Uh, co-authored was Images of America, Richmond Cemeteries. That was with Misty Thomas, and that was for Arcadia, which is now uh, co-owned by, or now uh, has merged with the History Press. So when I went to that publisher, I put together some of my best magazine clips and some of my best book clips from those different anthologies, and said, hey, I haven't done a book yet, but I've written stuff that's been published in other books and in magazines, and I have this idea for a book, and I'm going to co-author it with this person. And they gave me a chance. That book sold reasonably well for, for a history book. And um, yeah, so when I went to Brandy Lane, I was able to say I co-authored that book, I have been running Quellbell for a couple of years. I've published stuff in these places. Could we do this, this anthology? And that worked out well. So when I went back to the history press, um, I just told them, like, I, look, I published this through Arcadia, which at that time had been separate from the history press. This was before the merger. Now they're the same company. Uh, but I went to the history press, said, look, I did that cemeteries book. I've done these anthologies. And they they were all about it. Like that query was accepted the same week that I submitted it, which almost never happens. <laughs> um, yeah, but each time it's just gotten easier. And then when I pitched Ova, my um, collection of fiction and poetry to Dancing Girl Press in Chicago, I went with the exact same approach. Like, look, I published these other things and here's this. Can you publish this? <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, just it, just snowballing, right? Just building on those previous accomplishments. If you've done it once and you've done it reasonably well, then people are probably going to give you another chance. No, that's awesome because it seems like, you know, for you, 
as you've done it, the confidence builds so it makes it easier for you just to go to the next one, to go to the next one, to query the next one. Uh, and I think that's what a lot of writers struggle with. They struggle with once they get that uh, query together, just pressing send. Do you have any encouragement for that? Oh, my gosh. It's still scary. I joke about <laughs> all the time so my husband is a motion graphics designer so he also like he does animation and titles for tv and film so he's also an artist and very (laughs) and he struggles with confidence all the time but i tell him like oh my god i just wrote this story like i just spent two weeks interviewing all these sources i don't know if i want my editor to look at it and every single time he says just send it just do it because here's the thing like the publisher or the editor is has already believed in you enough to to assign you a piece right uh and and from there you really have a chance to just prove it to them like if you're public if you have already published pieces in magazines and newspapers, those editors, those publishers have believed in you. So when you go to a book company, whatever kind of small press, medium press, large press, you need to just consolidate what you've done, show them links to your previous work, make sure that your query is as tight and to the point as it needs to be but really you've had all these other people believe in you just do it again no matter how scared you are just press send just do it <laughs> and if, if they don't like it that's okay oftentimes it's not personal i had i won't mention the the publishing company but i had a manuscript go up pretty high in the food chain at this publishing company and I was so excited I thought oh this is it this is it and the the person who was communicating with me kept emailing me these updates like okay well I've sent it to so-and-so and she's reviewing it and so-and-so is reviewing it next and blah 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 and ultimately the manuscript was rejected um and for many publishers especially ones that aren't literary ones that are commercial it's so much about marketing. It's so much about what they think they can actually sell. And if they have any doubts about something selling, then they're not going to take it. And it could be brilliant. It could be very well put together. But if it's not right for them or if it's not right for them at this time, then they're not going to accept it. And it's not because you're a bad writer or a bad human being or a failure. They just can't take it at this time. So you can send it somewhere else. There's no problem with you just sending it and sending it and sending it until somebody takes it. Yes, that is so true. Um, I think back in episode 17, I talked to John David Mann. He's a New York Times bestseller. He wrote the book, The Go-Giver. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Oh, dude, it's one of my favorite books. I read it all the time. But he said that when he he first he co-wrote it, and he said when they first sent it, they was it was rejected 22 times. Wow. Yeah, and he said then the the 23rd picked it up, and it became a New York Times bestseller. So wow. you just never know, like you said, you never know. It's, it's not a personal thing. It's just that every publisher has a different objective, and you may not be the author for them. They might not be the right fit, and then the right fit comes along for you at some point. Yeah, and I think uh, writers always have to think with a business mindset as well. It's very smart to see as far back, go as far back in a publisher's history as you can. Look at their directories, read their other titles, make sure that you're not pitching something that's too similar to what they've already done. You want it to be in the same vein as their work. I mean, don't pitch a basketball book to a publisher that only does books on flowers like make sure you do your market research but um you you yeah you just have to think with a business mindset and just keep trying again and again and not take it personally if something's rejected yeah have that thick 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 skin like ogre thick (laughs) really And I think it's it can be so hard because 
the artist or the storyteller in you is constantly battling with the business person in you. But when it comes to when it comes to writing the book, that's where the artist comes in. When it comes to selling the book, making sure it gets picked up somewhere, that's where the business person has to win. And you just have you have to let that part of you do all the talking and all the thinking uh, once you actually start pitching the book. Right, exactly. Um, now let's talk about your current project. Let's talk about OVA. Tell us, a little, yeah. tell us a little bit about OVA, what it's about, kind of, you know, dish on yeah, it. Yeah, sure, sure. So that is a chat book, which means it's teeny tiny. It's about 30 pages of flash fiction and poetry. So flash fiction, in this case, is fiction, is stories that are um, a thousand words or fewer. And the poems are really all lengths. Um, but I had... I had previously been signed with a small publisher and that deal fell through. This is back in college. And this is what I'm saying about like always just try, try, try again. Um, that, that deal fell through and I was absolutely heartbroken, but I think ultimately it worked out because I was able to take many of these stories and polish them and submit them to a publisher that I think is just a better fit. So the stories all are about the female body in some way. Um, and Dancing Girl Press is a feminist press. So they only represent works by female writers. And they prefer stories that deal with uh, women's issues in some way. So all of, all of these stories do. Now, it's not just literally... Roe versus Wade, like the whole way through, but they're they're just different ways that the book touches on breast cancer, uh, menstruation, just all sorts of things. Not and not even in an overt way. Just this is a female character, and this is her story. Um, and the book's going to come out in the spring. I'm really excited about it. Very cool. So, what's what was the inspiration behind putting that book together? So when I so originally the the book that was dropped before was called Once Upon a Body and that was a much bigger collection of of works about the female body um, but I I decided to when that deal didn't work out um, just regroup some of the stories and look more carefully at some of the themes so these stories all. I'll have um, a maternal angle to them that not all of them in the original collection did. And I guess just generally, like, uh, I, I've been so interested in women's issues ever since I was a kid that I wanted to to write more about the female body. I mean, so often... In, in media, in uh, literature, in all sorts of storytelling forms, we hear jokes about, oh, well, women and their time of month. Oh, grumpy women. Oh, you know, those, those hairy-legged feminists, those feminazis. Those, like, okay, but there are all kinds of women out there. And every single woman, regardless of her color, her creed, her economic background, Every woman has the body, <laughs> and every woman relates to that body in a different way. And I just wanted to to tell stories from these different perspectives of these different women, and um, and not just focus on abortion because honestly, so often that's one of the only ways that women's bodies are discussed. But our bodies are are a lot more complicated. And, and different in many ways than men's bodies are. And it's worth mentioning other aspects of women's bodies and the female experience versus this one act. So that's that's what it was. Just Ooh. so many things going on in the news. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that makes the best writing, though. When you find something that you're passionate about, you find a topic or, an, or something that's... that's uh, trending that's really strong that people want to know more about. I think that's always creates some of the best writing. 
Yeah, I hope so. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Oh man, you should you should have uh, you should have released your book today. I know. I <laughs> like it should have been should have been a Trump book. It should have been a, an election day book. It should have been an election day book. It's the perfect time to release it. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about the other book that you had released earlier this year, back in uh, I believe it was June, the Hispanic and Latino Heritage in Virginia. Yes. Yeah. So it came, I, I think the online edition came out in June. The print one came out in September. I, I even, I have trouble keeping yeah. track, which is, uh, uh, which is actually Latino heritage month, right? Hispanic heritage month. Yeah. September Partially, 15th. Yeah. October 15th. Right. Yep. yep. Uh, so, uh, my mother is from El Salvador. My father is white American and I, as I mentioned earlier, I was raised in Arlington, Virginia, but I've also lived in other parts of Virginia. Um, I've lived in Richmond, I lived in Rappahannock County, and I've traveled across the state, stayed with friends across the state. Um, when I was growing up in Arlington, my mother was the only Hispanic mother at my public school up until fifth grade and then we had a Chilean boy and a Puerto Rican boy move to the school and and, and obviously their mothers were Chilean and Puerto Rican um, but until that point my mother was regularly confused for my nanny uh, because Arlington that part of Arlington North Arlington was not very diverse almost everybody was white almost everybody had a college education worked a very good government job. There were mothers from other countries, but most of them were European. Uh, we had a French mom, we had a Spanish mom. We did have one Japanese mother. <laughs> uh, so she stood out a little bit, but she was also very educated and had this excellent government job, like came here because of some kind of international appointment. Uh, and my mother always felt so self-conscious when I was a little girl she would one of her closest friends actually was a nanny uh, who cared for my little friend at the time in kindergarten first grade um, and I remember my mom went so when my parents first got married they lived in Miami and in Miami my dad always jokes that it's the capital of Latin America because there are so many Hispanics and Latinos there my mom never felt uncomfortable. She could speak Spanish anywhere. She could get all kinds of Central American food, uh, really, at any time. But when she moved to Arlington in the 80s, it was just a very different experience. It was a culture shock for her. And she just, like, she tried to get my dad to sell our, our family home at least once or twice when I was little because she just didn't want to be there anymore. She was sad. She was homesick. She wanted to go back to my to Miami. Uh, so just watching my mom as I was growing up and and watching all the different ways that she struggled and all of her efforts to make sure that my sisters and I had friends who were not just like the children at our school. I mean, she would drive us to other parts of Arlington where there were bigger immigrant populations, not just with Hispanic kids, but all kinds of kids. Like we were great friends with an Egyptian family that, who didn't live in our part of Arlington. They lived in South Arlington. Um, so, so growing up with that experience, um, I really started to notice when more Hispanics came into Virginia, I started to notice how Arlington was changing. When I lived in Richmond, when I moved to Richmond for college, I started noticing how even in the short period of time I was there, the city was changing. Um, like the Virginia Center for Latin American Art, which sadly doesn't exist anymore, was founded while I was in college. It was like the very, I think it was my last year of college. So that really flourished once I graduated and the couple years I lived in Richmond after I graduated. Um, and I, I was just fascinated by how the state was changing in such a, a short period of time, you know, basically in 25 years um, since since I was little to 
to growing up. So when I I had some success with my Richmond Cemeteries book, that's when I went to the history press and said, I want to tell the story of how Hispanic and Latino populations are changing in Virginia across the state. Every region is different. Uh, I want to profile some of the movers and shakers. I want to introduce some of the culture, different cultural aspects to people who aren't Hispanic and Latino and might pick up the book because they're wondering, well, how come my church has all these Spanish services now and how come the service is different than the English service? Um, how come we have a Mexican and a Salvadoran restaurant? What's the difference between these two cultures? That sort of thing. So, I mean, the book is like 135 pages. It's not terribly long. It's really just an overview. But the, the idea was really just to introduce what's going on in Virginia, how the state is changing and trying to adapt for this population. Well, you've definitely proved today that writing about your experience is a very real and profitable thing. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, really, right? Write what you know. Yes. And I know it probably sounds so obscure, like Hispanic and Latino heritage in Virginia. I remember when, so I moved to New York a few months ago, and um, there were a couple of places where I had to promote the book. And some people thought, well, wow, yeah, that is so obscure. Why? What is there to write about there? Like, are is there really a Hispanic population in Virginia? You know, of course, some, some New York snobbery there, too. Like, <laughs> especially been to Virginia, just wondering. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, the reason why I was able to write that book was because of who my mother is and what my childhood was and just what I grew up seeing in my home state. You can live anywhere and write a book. You don't have to be in New York. You know, I can't, you can't, you really, I could have stayed in Virginia and been doing most of the same stuff. It really would not have made a difference. You just write about your life and it doesn't have to even be your personal life if you don't wish to write about it but just things that you've observed from your experience you can do third person reporting just on things that you know from your personal life without ever writing first person if you don't want to yeah and I, and I was reading something uh, maybe it was a few months ago where it actually said I guess Salvadorians have the largest Hispanic population in Virginia yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and that that's definitely changing. Um, but it's because uh, it's really because of the Civil War that happened there from the late 70s to the early 90s. And uh, Salvadorans earned refugee status in the United States in the mid 80s. And at that point, uh, many people relocated to the D.C. area or Los Angeles. That's where they were placed. That's where uh, communities were already starting to form and they got bigger and bigger. Well, so how, so how do you go about starting a project of that magnitude? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in my case, I was very lucky that I had done so much magazine and newspaper work on topics related to immigration and Hispanic culture, Hispanic business owners. Um, and I was able to get permission from many of the publishers to not exactly run previous articles, but I was able to adapt a lot of what I wrote for local publications. I still had to lend um, national context to what I was writing and statewide context. I had to do a lot of rewriting to make sure that nothing was too local. Um, but that it was even with all of that permission, I still had two and a half years of research, of reporting, of interviewing different people, of going to different libraries, uh, different sites, taking photos, coordinating with my little sister who lived in Mexico at the time and was able to provide additional photos for me. 
Um, I mean, with the with the history press, they have such a specific. This is what I was saying before earlier about format. Uh, when you're writing for a series like I did, there is a specific format. There are guidelines that you have to follow. So I had to write to those guidelines to that format. So it was nice to have those limitations in a sense because it helped me organize my thoughts better. Um, but it also meant that I had to research in do research in some veins that I wasn't anticipating and I wouldn't have done otherwise. Like, honestly, I'm not sure how much I would have focused on business as much as food <laughs> because I love food. <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> not as excited about business, but it was still important to research Hispanic business owners in Virginia. Um, yeah, I mean, if I were if I were writing something that were more free form without as much formatting, then I would have had to think a lot more carefully and creatively about how I was or going to organize the book. Dude, it's so fascinating. Just all the work that you do from the anthology to the writing to the press. <laughs> so just, you're such a well-rounded and exciting writer to talk to. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to bring you back on again. I'm just running out of time, but because I, I really want to talk to you about a lot of the publication work that you do at another date, if you'd come back on and do that. Yeah, sounds great to me. That would be great. All right, let's come in for a landing then. Um, so, who, who are some who are some authors that you really admire that you know help to shape your work? Yeah, um, there are all sorts of people. I really like the political work that Emily Shire does at Bustle. She's just excellent at looking at the intersections between feminism. Uh, the Jewish experience and politics. I'm not even Jewish, but I'm fascinated by Judaism because of the way she writes about Jewish identity. Um, I love, for fiction, I love Jamaica Kincaid. She's one of my favorites. Uh, really like anything, well, for satire, I really like anything by David Sedaris. Um, Especially me talk pretty one day. I went through speech therapy as a child, so I can relate to that book very well. Uh, for plays, Sarah Rule is probably my favorite playwright. Um, I first saw A Clean House produce... No, no, Dead Man's Cell Phone. That's right. I saw that in D.C. back in high school at the Woolly Mammoth Theater. That's where it opened, and ever since then have just been enchanted by her magical satirical work um a good solid just like daily online writer is suzanne weiss she writes for glamour refinery 29 all these uh websites for millennial women and she also brings in a great relatable but still political uh, tone to her work that I appreciate. She does a lot of great research. Uh, for personal essay work, uh, I like Lisa Marie Bazile. She also does beautiful poetry. And she writes a lot about being a millennial woman, but also what it was like to uh, grow up in an economic class different from that of her classmates. She just... Like she went through the foster care system, writes in really interesting ways about that. Um, yeah, those are just those are just some of them. Right now, I'm reading um, uh, "Teaching While Black," and I cannot I cannot remember the author's name. I'm blanking. Um, yeah, but that's all about what it's like to teach in the New York City public school system as a black woman. And that's, that's also fascinating. I love anything that deals with race, cultural, cultural identity, religious identity, just these really central things that 
for some reason, have to become so controversial. It's like, I know. <laughs> it's like, these are everyday things, guys. We can talk about who we are, how we were raised. It really shouldn't be a big deal. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but, and, and as I, I'm mainly, met, I think the only male author I just mentioned was David Sedaris. I read a lot by women. Um, too. Just in general, I try to because I think, um, yeah, and and people of color. There's just not enough attention paid to writers who who have those identities. And I want to try and do my part. Like it costs nothing for me to walk to the library and pick up another book by a woman writer, by a Caribbean writer, by a Jewish writer. Like we don't always have to read works by old dead white men <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> no that's so great uh just the level of diversity and i'm sure just you know reading so much definitely enriches a lot of your writing too yeah yeah no i love to read i love my library <laughs> <laughs> now what tools would you can you recommend to writers you know like you know like an evernote or a scrivener what tools do you like to use that you can recommend i <laughs> All right, I'm going to go against my generation. Um, I really don't use that much. I mean, I have my laptop with me always, but I just use Word. Um, sometimes I'll use Google Docs if I have to share something with an editor, like if they want to have all of my sources um, to, to double check or to follow up with, especially if I have anonymous sources. Um, I use the the recorder app on my phone a lot, the voice memo when I'm doing interviews. But still, I'm I always have my notebook, I always have my pen and my laptop, and those are my main things. I think nothing, really nothing, can substitute the good old fashioned just regular tools. It helps. I mean, yeah, on my phone. Uh, let's see. Besides the voice memo app, oh, I take a lot of photos. I should mention that too. So I do take a lot of photos for reference, especially when I'm doing on the ground stuff. Even if these are not photos that are going to be published, I think it can it can really help me when I'm in a situation where I'm running around and I can't always take detailed notes. Well, I can take a photo and I can refer to that later and then just write down the things that are not captured in the photo um yeah but i don't i don't use any of the other scrivener any of that stuff <laughs> just the basics i like it <laughs> keeping it simple all right and then tell our listeners how can they connect with you the easiest way is to go to wordsmithchristine.com that is my portfolio site and there there's a link to quail bell magazine there's a contact form so you can email me. My phone number's there, though. Please don't call me unless it's it's pressing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and samples of my work are there. Samples to some of my visual work are there as well. Yeah, that's the easiest thing, wordsmithchristine.com. Awesome. Wow, what a great conversation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ambled around, but thanks. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's great. It's just it's so robust, everything from... You know, how you put your anthologies together to how to, you know, be bold and contact publishers to how people can get started. It's It's been great. So thanks for the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll do it again soon. Good.